So the Gibbs isotherm is going to answer the question, what happens if we take a beaker with some solvent at some particular temperature, and we'll call the solvent molecule one, and we're gonna take some solute and put it into the beaker, dissolve it in the solvent. We'll call that chemical number two. Well, the question is, what happens to the surface tension when we add in that solute? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? And by how much? And it turns out we can answer that question just by using two simple equations. So we'll start with the differential form of the Gibbs function. So we know we always have minus STT plus VDP plus if we have an open system, one where we can put things in, and we're certainly putting a chemical in here, we have to worry about the chemical potential of each chemical and how many moles that increases or decreases. Then we have to sum that over all the different chemicals in the system, all the different components. And then our system certainly has a surface, so we have to worry about changing the area of that surface. So if we increase the area of the surface, we can increase the Gibbs energy of the surface cost us energy to do that. All right, so that is our first equation. And our second equation is one where we look at not the differential of the Gibbs function, but the Gibbs function itself. And since the chemical potential, we can think of it as a Gibbs energy per mole for each substance, we could actually integrate that to get all the various substances. So if we take the Gibbs energy per mole for each component, multiply it by the number of moles and components, that gives us the amount of Gibbs energy due to each component. So if we sum up over all the components in the system, in this case it would be component one and component two, we get the total Gibbs energy. We also have to worry about the total surface energy. So the surface energy we know has, uh, surface tension has units of joule per meter squared. So if we multiply it by the meter squared of the surface, we have the total amount of surface energy. We add those two components together, we have the total Gibbs energy. So let's call this uh, perhaps equation one and equation two. So we've rewritten these just looking at the part of the Gibbs energy due to the Gibbs dividing surface. So we've marked all the terms with sigma, denoting that they're surface terms. The total energy, the total Gibbs energy of the surface has components due to the uh, the entropy of the Gibbs dividing surface. Uh, what about this term? Well, we know that the Gibbs dividing surface has, is infinitely thin, so it has no volume. So this term we can right away mark is going to zero. In this term we have the chemical potential of each component, uh, the amount that the number of moles of each com of component in the Gibbs dividing surface changes. And then we have, the, of course, the surface energy of, the, uh, of that Gibbs dividing surface. Over in this term over here, we've written this in, this, in equation two, we've rewritten equation two just looking at the surface component. So of course, the total energy of the system is going to have an expression like this for every phase that's there plus the interface between them. So we'd also have a term for the, for the bulk solvent. But now we're just looking at the energy of the interface. Let's take two and let's label it as equation two prime. We're just gonna take the differential of equation two. So we have to use the product rule. So we have Ni surface d mu i plus mu i d Ni surface. And we have to do the product rule with the surface tension term as well. So we have gamma dA, and we have A d gamma. Now if we look at equations one and equations two prime, they're both equations for the change in the Gibbs energy of the Gibbs dividing surface of the interface. So it must be that equation one and equation two prime are equal. So let's set them equal to one another. So equation one will be our left hand side. So we have minus entropy of the surface dt plus mu i dn i for all the components on the surface 
plus gamma dA. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have equation uh, 2 prime. So we've got the sum over all the components, ni d mu i, plus the sum over all the components, mu i d n i. And we can just about squeeze it in, gamma d a plus a d gamma. So we've just put 2 prime over here and equation 1 over here. Now looking at this, we can see there's terms that we can cross off. So let's go ahead and cross them off. We've got the, we've got the mu dn term on both sides. We have the gamma dA term on both sides. So we get a much simpler equation. So let's rewrite that equation a little more neatly. And we've got minus entropy t for the surface is going to be equal to the sum of ni d mu i plus the area of the system times the change in surface tension. Notice what we're trying to figure out is how surface tension responds when we change the composition of the system. And we have a d gamma term, and that's going to be our key to finding how surface tension changes. Let's solve for d gamma. So we'll have minus a d gamma on this side. We'll put the entropy term on the other side. And let's remember that we're talking about the, everything is going to be just at the interface here. And let's go back one slide and remind ourselves, we were trying to find out what happens to surface tension when you add a solute. And let's add the constraint that we're going to be doing this. We're going to be adding this solute at a constant temperature. So we're going to just do this at room temperature or at the boiling temperature of the solvent or some thermostatic temperature. So we're doing this at constant T, hence the word isotherm. So given that, we know that the dt term is going to go to zero. So we'll just save time by getting rid of that right now. So we'll then uh, let's divide both sides by negative a. So we're solving just for the change in surface tension. So we have negative 1 over a. And then we have this summation of all the different chemical components and the changes in their chemical potential. Let's remind ourselves what kind of system we're talking about. We said that we had a solvent, which we'll call chemical component one, and a solute, it's chemical component two. So let's write out this sum explicitly. Since we only have two components, two chemical components in our system, we've got the number of moles of the solvent, change in chemical potential of the solvent, and we have the number of moles of the solute, change in the chemical potential of the solute, and once again, remind ourselves we're talking about at the Gibbs dividing surface or the interface. Okay, so once we've had this, we're going to distribute that number of moles in our equation. So we have number of moles of one at the surface, divided by a mu and the number of moles of 2 at the surface the mu 2. And we have to remind ourselves here for a second that n is not the number of moles of something at the surface, it's the excess number of moles of something at the surface, which means that n i divided by the area is the surface excess. So for each substance, the number of moles at that Gibbs dividing plane that can't be accounted for by looking at the other phases is the surface excess, right? So we have the excess number of moles of that substance at the surface 
divided by the area of the surface gives us the surface excess. So we can rewrite this equation as d gamma is negative the surface excess of the solvent, change in chemical potential of the solvent, and the surface excess of the solute, change in chemical potential of the solute. And at this stage, we can remember the convention that is typically used with the Gibbs dividing surface is that we place it such that the surface excess of the solvent is equal to zero. And once we apply that convention, that's going to get rid of this term. And then we can write that the surface tension changes as a function of the surface excess of the solute. This naturally prompts the question, what is the change in chemical potential of the solute? Fortunately, we've got an expression for that. The chemical potential of component two is equal to the standard state chemical potential of component two plus RT log of activity. And just to remind ourselves what this means, uh, the standard state could be something like one molar concentration. And for an ideal solution, there's a very simple expression for activity. For ideal solutions, the activity of component two is just equal to the unitless concentration. So it's the concentration in molarity, and we need to make it unitless, so we divide by one molar. So it's just unitless concentration for ideal solutions. For non-ideal solutions, we need to have an activity coefficient, as sort of a fudge factor. So we'll just keep this in mind. We'll leave it as activity, but you can think of it as concentration. Once we have this expression, we can take the differential of it. So we get d mu 2 is equal to RT d log of activity. And then we can plug this right into our expression up here. So we now have change in surface tension is the negative of the surface excess times RT D log of activity of component 2. And we can then gather the uh, differentials together to make a derivative and say D gamma D log activity of 2 is equal to minus surface excess of 2 RT. And this is the mathematical form of the Gibbs adsorption isotherm. And we'll examine this on a conceptual level in the next screencast.